So Alf, uh, you have obviously a vast amount of government experience. Um, judging from this past this experience, how do you think government can effectively respond to the emergent needs of a post COVID-19 world to ensure no one, including people with disabilities are left behind? Well, I want to start with a sort of a thought for everybody. And I think if you're have been involved in the development of policy, COVID has actually done something remarkable. It's made people interested, I think, in making policy and government. Uh, you know, when in our when have we ever had the chance to listen about what governments do on a daily basis? We're getting reports federally, provincially, municipally, almost in real time. And, and now I think we're getting a better understanding of the roles and responsibilities of government. And I think, you know what, going forward, it, uh, post COVID, I think you're going to see the, the general public much more interested in the decisions that are made by governments and how they're made. I think the other thing that I think that COVID has brought us is a really different role for media, which has just, it's fascinated me, that we have media actually being the official opposition of governments. They're the ones getting to ask the questions. And they're asking, you know, they're asking everything from day-to-day -day perspectives to big policy, to big policy questions. And I think that the other thing that media is doing is as they're asking the questions, they're they're showing the human response every day on what is happening to people. So here we are at a time when we think we're in crisis, where we've actually clearly demonstrated the roles of government. I mean, you hear, you know, you hear the the prime minister saying, "Oh, and we're meeting with the premiers tonight." You hear the the, the premier of Ontario saying, "Oh, I met with the mayor today. I'm having a meeting with mayors tonight." When I think I don't think people understood have ever understood that. I, I'll give you the best example. I think if you ask Joe Citizen, he would not have known before COVID that municipalities, for example, can't have deficits. And so now we're having this huge conversation on who's going to pay this bill, which nobody, it looks like, has actually started to add up the cost of or, or where it's going to take us. I think, though, that uh, at further on a policy perspective, I think we're in a, such a really interesting time coming out of COVID because at the same time as we're coming uh, out of COVID, Canada is coming out with, their, with the Accessible Canada Act. And this will increase awareness across the country of people with dis, of dis, for, of what's happened to people with disabilities because we've seen and we've had huge discussions, not necessarily, and I agree with Max, not necessarily with people with, disabili with disabilities, but we've certainly had discussions about people who are disenfranchised. And I think there's become a consciousness by, by the general public on how we're going to move forward with those those things, um, you know, the um, Canada has an opportunity to take this the discussion of social inclusion to a new level in all kinds of ways. Provident provinces, you know, and territories will will create the standards and the guidelines, and they'll do the regional interest. I think one of the unique things in Canada is because we're so geographically large we totally understand regional response and it's okay to be something different and when and because we've had this covid everyday experience of government i think now we're going to have a definition of which level of government should do what and i also think that uh the, at the end of the day and I've, I've said it earlier in my conversation we're going to hold governments more accountable on a very personal level because we we now have this what i think is a better understanding for people with disabilities though i think is how do we you know we're, we now have conversations about businesses are going to change some businesses are going to 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 not be around some businesses are going to be able to provide half service well let's 
push the conversation and the accountability to while you're rebuilding your business, while you're reestablishing your business, how can you in, can make it more accessible? For example, if you're in, if you're a restaurant who maybe had 50 tables and now might have to have 25, how will that design be more accessible for everyone so that everyone, even people with disabilities can come, come into the business? As a second thought, I, and I thought for today's conversation, I'd really like to talk about um, what's happening with slogans. Uh, you know, we're using the slogan all of us are using it. We're all in this together. And I think as Canadians, we really believe this. But I want to take that, that sort of thought and the Ontario experience on what a slogan can do. You know, in Ontario, as they rolled out the Accessibility Act, they sort of had, over 10 years, they had sort of three distinct periods or three distinct themes. The first one was it's the right thing to do. And, you know, we know as Canadians and in the response to COVID, people are really conscious of what's the right thing to do. We also, in Ontario, they looked at it's good for business. And I want to talk a little bit about that later in, as I move forward. But the most important one and the, and the thing that we've got to take forward and as, and, and as ad, people who advocate for people with disabilities and people with disabilities through their own voice is we have to make sure that everyone understands that no one should be left behind. And I can tell you from the Ontario experience it was the no one should be left behind that really moved the, 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 the measure in Ontario. When we look at the, the pandemic experience, we know that people believe that it's the right thing to do and that we know that no one should be left behind. I think where we get a little confused, I'm going to talk a little bit about this later, is I'm not sure we may be all in this together in fighting the pandemic, I'm not sure we're all in this together in the impact of the pandemic, because I think it's brought huge discussions about wage variants, women versus men, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I think as I, as I say that, I wanna point out something that I think is really basic to the discussion for people with disabilities and what's happened in, 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 across the country. Communities have responded unbelievably to this, to this, this, the COVID. Food banks have popped up like stores. I mean, places that didn't have food banks have them now. Uh, you know, we, we're taking people from shell from from the streets and putting them in shelters, and people are actually believing that's the right thing to do. And we're taking social media and the and, and our response to social media has become the norm. You know, I mean, it's 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 where everybody is is delivering their message. And I think the the the, the cool thing and the, the, the thing that actually happens in all communities is that neighbors are actually helping neighbors, whether they're getting them food or medication or walking their dog or, you know, just, you, you know, going to a window and saying hello. We're start we're seeing this whole, I, I would say, no, I wouldn't say renaissance, but a, a, a revigor of people caring about caring about people. Um, as I want to, I want to also, I guess, Beth. Well, before we run out of time, I want to sort of focus on the biggest change that I think that uh, that has happened, and it, and 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 Max alluded to it. And we've started to look very differently on how we work, and how we learn, and how that can be happening. You know, uh, people now are having debates about whether they can work at home or not work at home. I think though that what people are not understanding from a disability perspective is that what they're asking for is accommodation. And people with disabilities have since, for, since forever been asking for an understanding for the need for accommodation. And I'm hoping that, that employers will, will not only understand what like the, 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 the regular employee, so to speak, is asking for, but what other people might ask for. You know, we have, we've, we've accommodated people to work at home. 
we've accommodated people to to have variable working hours starting at different times, maybe because of childcare needs. We're holding virtual meetings and teams. And I mean, who hasn't been on Zoom in the last in the last month? Those are all things that people with disabilities have been asking for ad infinitum for a long, long time. And I think that we cannot take, we can't miss the chance to demonstrate to people that what they're asking for is what other people have been asking for as a long, in a, for a long, long time. That's a really good point. Okay, thank you. Um, I think what's, uh, you know, has happened though, is that this interest in working virtually has um, been, um, has has also been it's done something else, and that is it, the experience now is not only to work virtually, but think of what's happened to people. And I'm going to and I want to talk about this because it has financial impact. If you're working at home, and I and I'll use the, the Toronto experience, if you're not paying for Metrolinks, which isn't cheap every day, and you're not paying for a, a TTC pass to get you from, from the Union Station to your work, you're probably somewhere in the ballpark of $500 a month that you have in your pocket. If you're not paying for um, childcare because you're at home or you're, you, you know, you're, you've had to balance your hours, you're actually saving money. And what, you know, and what does that mean? So I think that my answer to that is that uh, people with that, um, you know, people with disabilities can do, can work as Max said, they can work virtually. They can, you know, they can work flexible, flexible work hours. And in fact, if you have a disability and you're on medication, flexible work hours is absolutely key. And I think that uh, the, 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 the other thing I think we have to present is that people with disabilities are not to be, they, they, they have edu they're educated. You know, in Ontario, they know that 50% of the people on ODSP, for example, have like have some level of post-secondary education. So, I mean, they're they're ready, willing, and able to work. So, um, I think I'm looking at the time, Beth, and I sort of do want to go to give you one another example before, and then I want to sum up. Right now, here's an opportunity that I think all of us should grab onto. Canada is focused on putting 5,000 people into jobs at the federal level. I think with what we've learned through these discussions through COVID is you know that the federal government does more than collect taxes. There's literally hundreds and of different types of jobs with different qualifications that, that, you know, that can be open. And I think that what the government needs to do is not only do they need to be able to demonstrate it, but they also need to be able to, to challenge municipal, uh, the, the, the provincial government and municipalities to, to, to do likewise. And then I think, you know, you, you bring in your local BIAs and your ch chambers of commerce and your franchisees, and you, 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 you have this response that I, th that I think is, is, is really, really Im important. The, the, the other thing, though, and getting back to the role of media, and this is absolutely key as we move forward with this opportunity, the feds have to tell the story. And it has to be about success. And they have to demonstrate that these 5,000 jobs are, that people that are taking these jobs who have disabilities are actually bringing value and, and, and uh, commitment to the job. And then I think that uh, we, once we've told that sto the story, I think they have to also then be able to take those businesses or, or the, 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 the employer side and, how, and both sides, not just the story about, oh, this person with a disability had a success, but why did it make a success for, for all Canadians? You know, the, big, the biggest barrier to uh, employment for people with disabilities is attitude. And I think that uh, what we, um, I think what we've seen is, you know, attitudes are caused by, by myths or misconceptions. And uh, I think that we now know that, uh, you know, people can work and be accommodated. We know that people, uh, you know, 
our, Max's point about the productivity, why wouldn't that be true of a person with a disability, et cetera, et cetera? Given the time, though, I want to sort of, I want to play devil's advocate here, and I want to throw out two thoughts, and this is the policy perspective that I want to people to think about as we sort of ponder today. We have, without a doubt, created a seen a, a, a gulf in how we value jobs. Um, getting back to the the you know my my statement about we've all been it's been different for us. It's very different if you're at home working and you're getting a full time salary than if you've been laid off and, and are you know are looking for benefits. But I think what we've what we've seen is that. Um, people uh the work that people for the most vulnerable we're paying we're paying the least amount of, of money we're talking about the role of psws we're not talking you when, when you hear the press talk it isn't about doctors although you know it, it, it is they talk about commitment but they're not talking about financial burden and so i think that as a as a national discussion i would forecast or predict that we're going to have to have a very serious, serious discussion on how we value work for people who are dealing with the most vulnerable. And then secondly, and I think, and, I, and I'm not criticizing the government because I think they did what they had to do, but I want to leave this thought with everybody. Almost instantaneously, the government decided that students who couldn't work over the summer would get $1,400 or $1,700 a month to, 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 to cover expenses. In Ontario, a person on a disability gets $1,100 a month. And they wow. right? I would say to you, that is a call for a national discussion on the rates for social assistance. So having said that, I will either let you ask me another question or I'll turn, it, I'll turn the mic over to somebody else. Thank you for having well, me today. Thank you, Alf. Well, actually, you, you have already answered my second question about regulations and policies. Uh, you've covered some important topics that I would like to delve a little further into as we proceed, including um, the State of the Accessible Canada Act and uh, other provisions that um, promote and further a inclusion-focused agen government agenda, government policy, um, as well.